Okay, so here we are on uh, chapter eight, which is masochism and sadism. And if we like, we're kind of at the uh, the end of the of the lower reaches of internal mediation. If we like, the kind of end of desire, which is out of its pride, aspiring to a kind of divinity, or you could say even anti-divinity in a in a certain uh, uh, real way. And in fact, reveals. Um, uh, through its its going off in the opposite direction, um, uh, obviously the real pattern of desire to what we're what we're really called uh, to and to and and to be um, uh, by making such a stark contrast, just in terms of, uh, in in improving itself by the by the ends of desire. So I mean, we have here. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a better resolution image, but it's it's the uh, image of Sisyphus who is um, <clears throat> condemned by a wrathful and angry divinity to roll this stone boulder uh, up and down uh, the the hill which I think is is interesting I mean that's definitely that, that in some in some in some ways that captures um, the essence um, uh, of of masochism um, especially but I mean the myth is a little bit different in, insofar as this is Sisyphus's punishment rather than something that he he willingly uh, undergoes but if we imagine um, and Switching that a little bit, if if we imagine uh, Camus, Camus' text, you know the 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 myth of of, of Sisyphus is almost like a manual of of, of masochistic, um, like a masochistic apologetics or something like that. Like the world is is meaningless and bleak and harsh and and uh, and without any any hope or possibility for the future. But so what can we do? Um, you know, he says he. Uh, you know, he he contemplates the question as to like the only reasonable question is is why do anything at all? You should just commit suicide because it's it's so bleak. But he says no. Um, you know, you have to you have to be like Sisyphus and push this boulder up the hill for no reason. You have to get into the the flakes of stone as they fly off of the boulder and find meaning in in the struggle and the endurance. I mean, this is the the, the masochistic structure in a certain t uh, sense, trying to div divinize uh, him or herself. Uh, in the face of, of what is bleak, always in opposition to, to, to true divinity. And I think what, what, what Camus misses and what the, the myth, I mean, as all myths do, really hide is the presence of uh, what's missing is is the invisible divinity, right? The the, the wrathful divinity that is the real source uh, in terms of of laying out for what appears like divinity uh, or for Sisyphus. So it's a kind of wonderful image that gets uh, eclipsed by the myth, but nonetheless, when 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 we are able to detect the underlying structure, actually uh, uh, reveals what's going on behind it. So this chapter, I apologize. Uh, the the text is is so is so good and so phenomenal that it's extremely quote heavy. So I'm going to spend an inordinate amount of time just merely reading off the screen. I'm not even sure how much I'll be able I'll I'll, I'll be able to to add on to it since um, uh, it's almost like there's some sec there's some parts that are just like this like this bit here I think is just a complete page basically uh, taken from the deck. So we'll go through we'll comment a little bit, but I think it should be clear enough just from the 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 amount of text uh, uh, that's here. <clears throat> so the master has learned from his many different experiences that an object which can be possessed is valueless. So in the future, he will be interested only in the objects which are forbidden to him by an implacable mediator. The, me the master seeks an er insurmountable obstacle, and he almost always succeeds in finding one. A man sets out to discover a treasure he believes is under, under a stone, and he turns to over stone after stone but finds nothing. He goes, he goes tired of such a futile undertaking, but the treasure is too precious for him to give up. So he begins to look for a stone which is too heavy to lift and he places all of his hopes that on in that stone and he will waste all of his strength on it so this is of course after some amount of uh if we like uh success within desire to put it to put it that way uh someone who has been able to bring much under uh his or her or his, his or her own uh, uh mastery and been disappointed with the results every time in terms of the objectives that have been uh propped up by it thus doesn't give up doesn't 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 think that maybe perhaps it's the pattern of desire itself or this uh, attempt uh, this ambition for for self divinization uh, that might that might be the real problem um, or indeed consider any other uh, alternative as maybe the one that might be true in in, in opposition to the to this falsehood um, but instead can only believe in that which is uh, the least promising and the most difficult and the most ferocious opposition that is the that is the thing that if we like uh, from the point of view of induction seems like the only thing that could possibly uh, be true and there's and there's much more to to, to excavate here. 
The masochist, for that is whom, is whom we have been describing, may originally be a master who has become blasé. Continual success, or rather continual disappointment, makes him desire his own failure, and only that failure will indicate an authentic deity, a mediator who is invulnerable to his own undertakings. As we know, metaphysical desire always ends in enslavement, failure, and shame. If these consequences are too long delayed, the subject's bizarre logic will force him to hasten their arrival. In the course of ordinary desire, the obstruction was a result of, it, of imitation. Now imitation is the result of obstruction. Enslavement leads to masochism even more directly than mastery. The victim of internal mediation always sees, as we may recall, a hostile intention in the mechanical obstacle which the, des which, which the desire of the mediator places in his path. The victim is loud in his indignation, but in his heart he, see he, he believes he deserves the punishment inflicted on him. The mediator's hostility always seems somewhat legitimate, since by definition the victim feels inferior to the person whose desire he copies. Thus contempt and obstruction only redouble desire because they, conform, they confirm the short step to choosing the mediator, not because of his seemingly positive qualities, but because of the obstruction he can provide. And the more a subject despises himself, the more easily he makes the step. So, again, uh, just from the point of view of desire for being, we've, we've been over this already, but just it, it, uh, in case uh, we've forgotten or it hasn't been, it hasn't, it hasn't struck or, or rung through as, as clear yet, the mediator is chosen as a mediator always uh, in terms of a kind of superior being, or at least occupies that position of superior being since he's mediating the desire um, uh, uh, to to the subject. At first, this me this model might be chosen for if we like positive qualities in terms of something that might seem good to em emulate according to a pattern of goodness that we might originally recognize from some from some remaining innocence uh, as good but later on especially through through patterns of scandal and through uh, uh, the transformation that we undergo as desire deepens it's the it's the ferocity and the violence and the opposition of the mediator that act, or uh, of the of the mediator as an obstacle that actually makes uh, the that 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 causes the subject to take the the obstacle the obstacle mediator or the rival mediator um, as the primary mediator. And so in terms of looking for a mediator to choose, it's only going to be the one um, uh, who confirms this feeling of inferiority, of lack, of uh, of, of self hatred and loathing that is going to be chosen um, as the as the one uh, 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 to whom uh, everything should be should be oriented towards. And there's kind of a positive and a potential uh, negative valence of there. And you can think of um, um, uh, the opposition to uh, the total opposite. You can think of total ideological opposition, where you pick a, an, another ideology that you know. Um, uh, hates you the most and is the most contemptuous of you, uh, and then this, uh, and then you you get so intensely focused on this opposing ideology precisely because of 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 the lack of being that it that it uh, and the recognition of the lack of being uh, that it instills inside of you. So um, you know here especially it's important not to begin with just thinking of masochism and sadism as we maybe n normally culturally think of them in terms of a purely sexual domain. Well, we will we will get to that in a second, but rather masochism as it might relate to anywhere where we end up in a situation totally fixated on the most brutal kind of opposition because that opposition generates the feeling for us of being uh, exceptionally exceptionally meaningful. And the more self-loathing we are, the more we're going to be tempted to just fly head first into whatever is uh, uh, the, the most uh, uh, difficult uh, and, and ferocious kinds of, of opposition. And I wouldn't want to say that I mean, sometimes we do that on the basis of, of real principles, and Gerard will vacillate on this just a little bit, although it's always going to be a vacillation that reveals, uh, look, like we looked at in terms of the, the difference between 2D and 3D imagery uh, very briefly in Chapter 6, it's going to be a vacillation that ends up revealing revealing more, uh, as, as, as we'll see. Um, but sometimes there is a kind of principled opposition, but even there, you know, we should be able to maintain a level of detachment, which otherwise, um, if we don't have spiritual health, if we, all, if we are all in merely from the merely because of the mimetic opposition, uh, then we're going to be unable to have that kind of, of detachment, and we really are going to be motivated by this by this sense of um, you know interior self-loathing, uh, from which we can only imagine is going to be remedied uh, or remedied and both confirmed and and remedied by our opposition towards uh, the model obstacle. The masochist perceives the necessary relation between unhappiness and metaphysical desire, but he nevertheless does not renounce his desire. By a misunderstanding even more, even more remarkable than those which preceded it, he now chooses to see in shame, defeat, and enslavement not the inevitable results of an aimless faith and an absurd mode of behavior, but rather the signs of divinity and the preliminary condition of all metaphysical success. Henceforth, the subject bases his enterprise, his enterprise of autonomy and failure. He founds his project of being God on an abyss. Now this is like a totally, I mean this is about the, the most 
most extreme end of masochism, uh, that, that, or the most extreme end of desire um, that things can 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 possibly go. Um, you know, we can chuckle at it from from some distance. Of course, we if we, if we, if we, we, we and as Gerard is keen to point out. You know, anyone in any experience of desire is no is no uh, uh, is not so far apart from this. It's the same underlying motor, maybe just not lived out with the same degree of intensity uh, as it is for for all per, uh, for all persons. And it's the same motor whether or not it belongs to the upper regions of of mimetic desire or down into the into the lowest depths of of the feeling of of hell of metaphysical desire. Um, uh, there is no absolute degree of separation, and there's no strict demarcation since it all belongs to the same system where you can say that things are, you know, absolutely healthy or absolutely sick, absolutely pathological or not. Um, things can jump, right, very easily depending on the proximity of the mediator and the object that's mediated in question from 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 nothing to to some. You can think of you can think of very ordinary people who suddenly someone cuts them off in traffic and they're they're ready to go <laughs> and scream out of their car and and uh, and take their head off. Um, and so these these guys of things like uh, they they don't they don't while there is and there's a lot going on in terms of you know personality differences temperamental factors or organic capacity for mimesis i i certainly i certainly think uh, there is a progression of desire uh, both individually as well as as well as collectively but there isn't this 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 outside point from which we can stand in and condemn no resemblance to to our own desires in terms of following the pattern of desire on its own i think that's very important to emphasize gerard's also going to point it out um, and uh, you know any remarks that I would have made previously in previous chapters uh, should be should be uh, should be read should be read or thought about with that in mind. Uh, the obstacle, even in the case of masochism, where it alone is directly sought, cannot be primary. The quest for the so Girard is responding here to another theorist of Rougemont, I believe, in the history of, of Western sexuality, which is saying that you know it's the obstacle, um, uh, and this is kind of like we were just talking about with Sisyphus at the beginning. It's the obstacle which is which is the source uh, which is the source of the generation of of passion, and 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 part of that is true. But of course, what's missing from this analysis is the role of the mediator. The obstacle is just a shortcut to the to the presence of the mediator which is the one that is doing the real driving and which the one for you know all sorts of different uh for all sorts of different reasons uh is is the one that is usually omitted from from our analysis it's 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 whatever the, the mediator happens to be focused on which is which which tends to be the um well focused on mediating to the subject the subject might that appropriate that to his or her own self and then and then claim priority of of that desire over, uh, and and refuse to acknowledge the, the the mediator there's different configurations but for um, you know it should it should the, the 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 blind spot for us psychologically should really be at the forefront in the sense that you know it took it, uh, the entirety of, of human intellectual history before this was really brought to, to formulation and then and then expanded um, uh, by Girard. I mean, Girard was is very humble to acknowledge that you know there's been previous insights in terms of the mimetic nature of desire and other theorists prior and prior to him. Um, you know, saying I believe in one spot that you know most of what he had said had already been in, in Saint Augustine, and indeed in Augustine's Confessions. Um, you know the nature of sin and mimetic desire is present early on in 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 some of Augustine's early dialogues, and there's lots of good stuff in terms of of the church fathers and and throughout Christian theological history as, as they've meditated on sin and psychology. Um, but nothing that has really been brought to this level of uh, of 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 uh, uh, vibrant uh, clarity and then unpacked and shown that it you know ultimately ends up explaining all of the domains that we properly attribute uh, uh, to the human. And of course, leaves the the door or the window wide open to the to the transcendent, and indeed indicates at the very least that the only possibility uh, that that we could have this human perspective in the first place is is from is from the priority of, of a divine which which moved and mediated first. But anyway, not to get not to get totally sidetracked by the theological. We'll come to more of that a little a little bit later in the in the last chapter and uh, a little bit in the end of this chapter and then towards in the uh, 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 in the intermediate the next chapter and then finally um, a, a lot more in the last chapter. Uh, <clears throat> 
In the lower stages of internal mediation, the subject despises himself so much that he has no confidence in his own judgment. He believes that he is infinitely far from the supreme good he is pursuing. He cannot believe that the influence of the good... And so here, the good that the, that the subject is imagining is the good of the end of, des of desire. So it's, it's him putting everything into desire and imagining that the mediator is the, is the source of that good. The mediator only being chosen by his implacable hostility, uh, thus providing the sign of his, his, his secret divinity, and that which makes him the the, the mediator uh, in the in the, in the first place, um, um, and and so he could only 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 this media because all of our sense of self, our own our, our own sense of, of self worth and self confidence is the result of what's being mediated to us by another. Um, you know this only compounds and then you know provides the anchor which which fixes the the the, the system in place. But it's important here to recognize that the, that the good is the good imagined from the ends of uh, selfish or prideful desire, if you wanted to put it that 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 way. Um, which is, I think we have it on the on the next, uh, yeah, on the next slide. So I won't bother uh, repeating it or re saying it ahead of time. He cannot believe that it, that the influence of that good can reach as far as himself. He is thus not sure that he can distinguish the mediator from ordinary men. He is thus. Uh, uh, he's not sure he to distinguish the mediator. Oh, I repeated the sentence. There's only one thing whose value the masochist thinks himself capable of judging himself, and his value is nil. The masochist will judge other men according to their perceptiveness with regard to himself. He will reject those who feel tenderness and affection for him, whereas he will turn eagerly to those who show by their contempt for him, real or apparent, that they do not belong, like him, to the race of the accursed. We are masochists when we no longer choose our mediator because of the admiration which he inspires in us, but because of the disgust we seem to inspire in him. From the standpoint of a metaphysical hell, the masochist reasoning is irreproachable. Which all seems very sad. Uh, the most serious obstruction is thus the one preferred above all. It is the one most suited to the intensifying passion. The description is correct, but we sh but should add that the most impossible obstacle has this value only because it indicates the presence of the most divine mediator. I sold would be less attractive if she were not the promised wife of the king, for it is to royalty, in the most absolute sense of the word, that Tristan aspires. <coughs> The masochist is at once more lucid and more blind than the other victims of metaphysical desire. He is more lucid in that he possesses that lucidity, increasingly prevalent in our own time, which permits him alone among all desiring subjects to perceive him, uh, uh, to perceive the connection between internal mediation and the obstacle. He is more blind because, instead of falling out of the implications of this awareness to their, nest, to their necessary conclusion, instead of giving up misdirected transcendency, he tries paradoxically to satisfy his desire by rushing towards the obstacle, thus making his destiny one of misery and failure. When the desiring subject perceives the abyss that desire is hollowed out beneath his feet, he voluntarily hurls himself into it, hoping against hope to discover in it what the less acute stages of metaphysical sickness have not already brought him. And I think this is the, the, the part that's really important in terms of, of, of relativizing our, our own situation. There is no clear division between the pre-masochism of Don Quixote and the unquestionable masochism of Marcel or the underground hero. Above all, one cannot be classified as normal and the others as pathological. The dividing line between sickness and health is always, an arbi is, is always arbitrary and drawn by our own desires. The great novelists erase this line and thus abolish another barrier. No one can say where a repulsive masochism begins and so-called legitimate ambition and noble hunger for what is risky leave off and so just to get back to the original formula which i think makes all of this very very clear is that every reduction of the distance between the mediator and the subject is a step in the direction of masochism and so um uh you know the the the, the confusion that that all of the psychologists of individual uh, uh, psychology always make is that it seems like you know it's a result of this this or that particular complex uh, uh within the subject that that the masochistic position is the one that is actually desired by the masochist the masochist even turns this up as an explanation having realized um uh, their own experience within desire that it, that in fact um uh, this this situation does seem to them to be the most desirable and they do seem to really want this sort of thing but actually this has to n none of this can be accepted as as the truth in fact what is really going on is is just the 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 end result of of the f of the of, of the subject having thrown him or herself into uh, the, uh, the the most ferocious opposition imaginable in order to attempt to realize the divinity to which all desire is aspiring right so often the subject is said is said to simply desire shame humiliation and suffering no one has ever desired any such thing every victim of metaphysical desire including the masochist covets his mediator's divinity and it is for this divinity he will accept if necessary and it is always necessary or even seek out 
out shame, humiliation, and suffering. He hopes that misery and suffering will reveal to him the person whom he should imitate in order to free himself from his wretched condition. And so, um, uh, 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 it, 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 you know, in, in responding to a bit of a, of a uh, in terms of, you know, if we're even going to use the term uh, clinically, um, uh, then then there's going to have to be the very specific situation which obtains in the course of, of uh, the evolution of the psychic, uh, uh, the evolution of, of uh, the psychic progression of the subject. So when, only when the subject is aware of the connection between desire and suffering can we speak of masochism, if the term is to retain any exact theoretical meaning. And so that, that kind of a situation is... Uh, um, one would think, excuse me, uh, much more rare, right? Not, not people don't don't normally uh, make this link between desire and suffering. They all they often occupy a much more intermediate uh, uh, position where you know what they desire and the opposition that they encounter in terms of their me mediation. Those are something like trade offs for the experience or so or something like that. The strict the strict line of of satisfaction from suffering um, uh, and the and the recognition of their own satisfaction from suffering is something that has to be carried through to a to a, to a pretty extreme end. This observer does not want to delve into the truth of desire to the point where he himself would be just as in, just or as much involved um, as the subject of, of his observation. So the people who want to stand apart and diagnose this or that as pathological or healthy or sick or, or, or twisted um, you know, want to give some kind of an explanation where their own desire would be, would be accepted from uh, the, the, the pattern of, med of, of mediation. Okay, and so this is, of course, uh, closely related to, or at least also explains, um, uh, sexuality and sadomasochism, which is um, uh, usually what we're thinking of when we, when we think in terms of sadism and, and masochism. Of course, what's going on uh, in sexuality and sadism, well, we'll get to it in, in a second, but it's quite interesting in, in just how counterintuitive is it is to our normal expectations uh, or, or usage of, of the terms. So closely related to the existential ma masochism, we have just described as the purely sexual masochism and sadism, which play an important role in the works of Proust and Dostoevsky. The sexual masochist tries to reproduce in his erotic life the conditions of an extremely intense metaphysical desire. Ideally, his partner and mediator would be the, the same person, but this ideal cannot, by definition, be achieved. For if it were, it would cease to be desirable, the mediator having lost his divine power. So, um, in this case, uh, um, um, uh, sexual sadomasochism, um, I, think I would think you know, in, in almost every case, it has, it has to be a kind of second order derivation, or and as it says in a second here, in, an imitation of, of the original masochistic structure, uh, sado or say, masochistic and sadistic structure, because in a real masochistic structure, the, the mediator is actually going to want l for, uh, really nothing to do uh, uh, with, with, the subject, with the subject in question. If it's going to be instantiated uh, in some kind of role play with a sexual partner, then it's at least going to be some kind of relationship of acceptance and the rejection is going to have certain limits or, or be confined by, by what can be um, uh, uh, instantiated uh, uh, within the role player, within the partnership uh, of the partner. So it's already a second order sort of, it's an imitation in two senses. One is an attempt to um, resemble a pattern of structure that already appears desirable from the point of view of desire, but then two, it's also an, an imitation of a reconstitution rather than um, the real um, uh, uh, rejection to which divinity seems to, to belong from the point of view. Uh, of the uh, within an actual masochistic structure, thus the ma uh, ideal is part of the same. But this ideal cannot be ceased to be desirable. The mediator having lost it, thus the masochist is reduced to imitating his impossible, impossible ideal. He wants to act with his sexual partner the role he would play, or so he thinks, with his mediator. The brutalities demanded by the masochist are always associated in his mind with those which a truly divine model would probably subject him. The sadist plays the role of the mediator himself. This change of role should not should not surprise us. We know that all victims of metaphysical desire seek the appropriate seek to appropriate their mediator's being by imitating him. The sadist wants to, pers to persuade himself that he has already attained his goal. He will try to take the place of the mediator and see the world through his eyes, in the hope that the play will gradually turn into reality. The sadist's violence is yet another uh, effort to attain divinity. So the sadist, perhaps more than the masochist, is consciously stepping into a role, whereas the masochistic position 
composition feels more, if we like, uh, authentic or, or, or ordinary or real. The sadist um, is, is, is amplifying the position of, uh, that we looked at in terms of hypocrisy or dandyism uh, the, within previous chapters, wherein the sadist is merely playing a role to constitute the, the, uh, the, 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 the structure. It is frequently it was frequently said that the sadist persecutes because he feels he is being persecuted. This is true, but it's not quite the whole truth. In order to desire to persecute, we must believe that the being who persecutes us thereby attains a sphere of existence infinitely superior to our own. So the sadist, in order to actually really believe in his or her own sadism, really has to believe from their own mediator and from their own model that they enjoy a superiority of existence precisely as a consequence of their 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 violent persecution. Uh, <coughs> But this is what's so, what is so interesting. The existential aspects of the masochistic sadistic structure precede its sexual aspects. This reversal is so constant that it can, it, can, it can by itself serve to define the transition from the true order, which is metaphysical, to these psychologies and psychoanalyses, which are very, the, very often, are very, the, the very opposite of the truth. So the psychologies and the psychoanalyses would start from the libidinal position, right? That all of this is arising from the libidinal drive, um, and that the existential aspects of, 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 of the masochistic masochistic structure are the extension of the original sexual uh, masochistic sadistic drive. And this is all reversed, of course, once we had the mimetic explanation in terms of how it is that sexual desire is. Uh, how can we think about this? I mean, this is, this is very different. So if we, th if we think of the instinctual apparatus that we have as like kind of like a, a pump, right? So there is this, this biological drive uh, for sexuality that, that we have. Obviously, this biological drive for sexuality that we have goes beyond uh, um, uh, the mere reproductive function, because we are permanently, uh, we are a permanent sexual species, right? So um, we don't enter into periods of eustress like other uh, human females don't enter into periods of eustress like in, like like females and other non uh, our non-human animal uh, answers. We don't have mating seasons or anything like this. We are our sexuality is 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 basically permanent. Um, um, so we do have this libidinal pump that's that's per, that, that, that is that is going on in terms in terms of uh, uh, motivating our, our appetite structure, but the mimetic aspects are are by far uh, the the primary aspect in terms of what's driving our, our sexual behavior and our sexual and, 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 our, and our sexual selection such such that that it can it can completely take over and override any kind of instinctual orientation or instinctual apparatus, which is very interesting in terms of understanding a whole uh, other panoply. Of of, of features of, of human sexuality, but this is you know the the reversal and the inversion of what of what someone like the like Freud or the whole Freudian or all the different varieties of the Freudian school that are coming after him is they're taking a libidinal uh, a libidinal first uh, kind of view of of human nature and human desire, and instead of course failing to recognize that it's the mediator that that is driving everything, and because it's the mediator driving everything, that it isn't restricted merely to the to the sexual domain, and the sexual domain is is if we like dragged along uh, 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 by the mediator. And of course, you know, it might be uh, spicy and interesting, and it might be something that we can definitely become fixated on, and we definitely do have a biological background uh, um, uh, of, of desire that, that tends us towards in, the, in that direction. Uh, but then nevertheless, it is not the primary uh, driver or motor of, 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 of the rest of our behavior, and it needs to be put, or at least it's very uh, illuminating to, to, to put things in the right order uh, from which then, uh, you know, a whole bunch of weird components of, of human desire can then be understood. So sexual masochism and sadism are second degree imitations. They're imitations of an imitation since the subject's existence in a metaphysical desire is, is already an imitation. So we already talked about that. The sadist never ceases to identify with the victim, that is, with persecuted innocence, even during the very uh, perpetration, of, uh, perpetration of evil. He is the incarnation of good and is mediator of evil. The romantic and Manichaean division between self and other is always present and even plays an essential role in sadomasochism. Deep in his heart, the masochist cannot stand the good to which he thinks he is condemned, and he worships the persecuting evil, for his mediator personifies evil. So even when everything has become upside, so you can think of like, it's almost like those like kind of cartoon supervillains where the, the supervillain is you know uh, he's you get those scenes where the supervillain is lamenting you know all of the tragedy that is his, that is his life and and how awful and evil the rest of the world is and and you know he's just trying to I don't know oppose or bring to light the the evil of the thing um, and in fact that you know it's the it's the good side of the supervillain or, or something or something like that the the, the sadist or um, uh, whoever within the oppositional structure is always imagining them desire is always imagining itself as 
innocent and good and the mediator in opposition uh, as the evil one and, and it's and it's weird because this lack of being the 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 adoration uh, and disgust that that is is both part of the mediator the same oscillation is of course present in the subject as well right so the subject in within the relationship of opposition towards the mediator the mediator is always to to, to blame for everything but then when flipped around and turned on to the subject you know it's it's the subject's own um, uh, emptiness and lack of being an insufficiency and horror that uh, of wherein nothing good could ever want him or or, or touch him um, that it, that turns uh, on the on 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 the owner assets and it'd be interesting to work out you know how it is very specifically that these oscillations and 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 dynamisms go 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 on or what's like the the interval of these of these these sorts of things I mean that's all you know very specific but that's stuff that could be um, uh, analyzed in in greater detail. The masochist identifies with all of the insulted and injured, and with all real imaginary misfortunes that vaguely remind him of his own destiny. The masochist has a grudge against every uh, against the very spirit of evil, and he does. You can almost imagine kind of like certain misanthropic positions that are so you know they they hate the horror of the world that they just want to eliminate the whole world entirely. That's almost like the the essence of the of the of the of like the absolute masochistic position. It's like this absolute hate, and then this like. You know, absolute sympathy against evil uh, simultaneously at the at the same time. The masochist is a, as a as a grudge against the very spirit of evil, and he does not want to crush the wicked so much as prove their wickedness and his own virtue. He wants to cover them with shame by making them look at the victims of their own infamy. At this stage of desire, the voice of conscience is indistinguishable from the hatred aroused by the mediator. The masochist turns this hatred into a duty and condemns everyone who does not hate along with him. So we can think of there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of contemporary movements, right, that uh, that that seek to be on the side of the victims, but you really have to wonder how much of them are actually concerned uh, with the lives of, of specific victims or the victims in question, uh, rather than uh, using those victims as a as a as a as a cudgel by which to to beat up their their oftentimes ideological uh, uh, opponents. Um, and it's those it's the hatred of those ideological opponents that is the real motivating force, rather than the concern for victims. So. In all of this, uh, as we'll see, uh, maybe we'll just skip ahead uh, uh, another quote. The masochistic ideology, like all the other fruits of metaphysical desire, is an inverse image of vertical transcendency. All the virtues of Christian morality are found in masochism, but their hierarchy is inverted. Compassion is never a principle, but a result. The principle is hatred of the triumphant wicked. Good is loved in order that evil be hated more. The oppressed are defended for the sake of overwhelming the oppressors. The masochistic vision is never independent. It is always in opposition to a rival masochism, which is organized the same elements into a symmetrical and inverse structure. Dostoevsky suggests in The Possessed that all modern ideologies are penetrated by masochism. The unfortunate Shatov tries desperately to see, escape the revolutionary ideology but ends up with a reactionary ideology. And you can think of you know, the revolutionary ideology is kind of like this upside down Nietzsche that is the, the masochistic ideology uh, that isn't really in favor of the oppressed but is actually just wanting to use the oppressed to overwhelm and destroy the oppressors. Uh, versus the reactionary right side up Nietzsche and ideology, which, um, having been oppressed, you know, seeks to appropriate the identity of the oppressor whom he associates with a kind of superior being and imagines a kind of divinity. Both are false forms of transcendency, uh, and both have the most uh, miserable and bitter fruits. The masochist is fundamentally a pessimist. He knows that evil is destined to triumph. It is despairingly that he fights on the side of the good. The fight is therefore all the more commendable, which is, you know. For anyone who's ever fought a good fight, that didn't that didn't exactly seem like um, uh, uh, it was it was winnable. The, we 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 could at least we could at least detect um, a kind of uh, uh, the underlying motor of how it is that we would that we would that we would choose to persist uh, in the face of such overwhelming uh, overwhelming odds. And so in this, and this is where it's interesting, right? Because we would be, we would then be tempted to say, well, then there is no case in which there are actual oppressors uh, that do need to be stopped, and and uh, and and that is that is clearly not what Gerard believes, and it's clearly not what makes sense in the light of all of this, but in fact, a whole new position opens up, which is like, uh, which I really love the, the image that he used in terms of the modern artist that can only paint in, in 2D rather than the, the, the 3D novelist. Uh, the same thing seems true in terms of the generation of, of moral purse capacity. So it is in the surpassing of the Slavophile ideology that we find the finest moments of Dostoevsky's genius. Do not hate the atheists, the professors of evil, the materialists, or even the wicked among them, for many are good, especially in our time. 
Dostoevsky and everything prior to the brothers Karamazov and Proust throughout his work sometimes yield to a common temptation. They endow certain characters with an essential wickedness, with a cruelty or an illusion of cruelty. These passages reflect the sadomasochistic structure of experience. They do not reveal it. And so it is only by going beyond the, 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 the accusation and the recognition of the adorable persecutor is neither a god nor a demon, he is merely a person like ourselves, the more eager to hide behind his own suffering and humiliation because they are all the more intense. So the genius of the true novel rises above the oppositions that stem from metaphysical desire. It tries to show us their illusory character. It transcends the rival caricatures of good and evil presented by the factions. It affirms the identity of opposites on the level of internal mediation, but it does not end in moral relativism. So that is, um, um, it, rec it, 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 it recognizes the identity of the different terms that are generated through the opposition within inter internal mediation, but at the same time doesn't end in, in, moral, re in, 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 role, in moral relativism. Rather, we can actually, actually finally have the distance to, to kind of step back where we can recognize uh, the same patterns within our own behavior, the same uh, tendencies within, within our, if we like, our universal fallen nature. Um, um, we can recognize the, 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 the universal depravity of, of all persons that were that we're all sinners um, and in doing so we step back from from attempting to see the other who we might actually need to oppose as the devil incarnate or as you know some kind of absolute uh, and total and total monster um, that they too you know have a history and they are they they are they are people as well irregardless of even the worst and most heinous um, uh, evils that they may have committed uh, evil exists. The tortures inflicted by the underground man on the young prostitute are not imaginary. The suffering of Vintui, uh, Vintul, Vin, uh, I'm gonna, uh, that's shameful, Vintul is not only, is, is only too real. Evil exists and it is metaphysical desire itself, deviated transcendency, transcendency, which weaves man's thread in the wrong direction, thus separating what it claims to unite and uniting what, claim, what it claims to separate. Evil is that negative pact of hatred to which so many men strictly adhere for their mutual destruction. And so if we could just step out of uh, uh, these symmetrical oppositions, and if we could uh, step out of, of seeing the even what we need to oppose, uh, even the, the evil that really exists, but stepping out and seeing those who perpetrate it. What is, what is, what's the formula of St. Augustine to, um, uh, to, to uh, love, uh, uh, hate the sin but, but love the sinner? Um, that, that, that right there, that, that whole, it's like another wonderful thing. This is, this is a complete digression, so I'm even, I don't know, I probably should, <laughs> you probably shouldn't in include it, but there's, there's a, there's a formula from, from, uh, Alistair Crowley, uh, and he, he borrowed it from, from Rybley's in, it, that was written over the, um, the, the wall of his imaginary uh, uh, mon monastery and it's you know the, the whole the whole rule of the monastery is do what thou wilt right so it's the it's the supreme it's the supreme call of the emancipation of desire and the, that's what that's the that the sole criteria of good and evil is 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 what thou wilt and so on and so forth and there's this other formula from Saint Augustine, which is so close and yet a whole world apart, right? Which is, uh, w which is love and do what you will. So it's putting the priority of love, uh, genuine love of the other uh, for another as another, um, uh, over and beyond the primacy of one's own prideful uh, will, which creates and constitutes. It's so close and yet a whole world apart. And that is, I think, what the, the exact same kind of thing that is revealed in looking at these two different patterns of desire as they play out from vertical to deviated transcendency um, is just they, they emerge as being so similar and yet absolutely different, uh, 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 manifestly uh, uh, absolutely different at the same time which is which is um um at the very least interesting um <laughs> the, the, the most if you had to be, you'd have to be, i think you'd have to be uh, excessively skeptical to just be like well you know that's that's an interesting coincidence okay so anyway i think that is um Yes, that's the end of, 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 of masochism and, and sadism there. Uh, certainly, it's a great chapter. I, I brought in and, and, and wrote out what must have been half of it uh, in the quotes there, uh, but the rest of it, the rest of the, the text sh uh, should definitely be investigated. Um, uh, it's certainly interesting, and I think uh, it's, uh, it's, it's room for, for, for new insights to actually be explored uh, and to be generated as well in, in, in terms of unpacking um, our own mimetic psychology. So next, we're going to look at chapter 9, which is the, the worlds of Proust, and then I think I actually skip a chapter. Let's see, one sec. <clears throat> like chapter six. Um, worlds of Proust. Yes, there's a there's a chapter on Proust and Dostoevsky, which I think 
I did not include. Maybe I'll go through it and just do another quick summary like we did for for uh, for, for chapter six. And then finally, we end with the Dostoevsky and Apocalypse uh, and the conclusion. So I hope that was uh, uh, enlightening and fun and interesting. And um, uh, I look forward to being with you on the next one.